I believe that we are just in for a special treat. Um, it has been my honor to serve as your MC since Thursday. It's been fun. It's been amazing. It's been great. Janine said something on Thursday, no, Friday, that uh, really inspired me and that clicked with me. Um, as a youngster, born and raised on the east side, uh, riding up and down Mount Elliott was not unusual for my mom and my, my dad as we had family that lived all over the east side. And I remember being around five years old and being fascinated with this space with the dots and the teddy bears. And anytime we were riding down uh, Mount Elliott, we had to go and drive through the Heidelberg Project. At the time, I didn't know what it was called. I just knew it was like this fun place. Um, and every time, my mom would drive us through there. And a few times, she'll let us get out and walk it. And Janine said, she answered a question. The question was, uh, what does Heidelberg 360 mean? And it is, she said it means a complete dot, uh, a complete circle. And being here today at 29 years old and thinking back over 20 years ago when I was five has been a complete dot, a complete circle. And I'm just grateful to be here. I'm inspired to be here. I'm inspired to see people operate at their genius and it has been an honor. So without further ado, for the last time this weekend, I am going to introduce the doctor, I'm putting respect on her name, the president CEO of the Heidelberg Project, Miss Janine Whitfield. Let's give her a hand. It has been amazing, hasn't it? I am so moved and touched and uh, inspired by what has transpired over these last four days and bringing so many different kinds of people together. And, you know, we're a nucleus. We're just a nucleus. But what has been shared in private conversations about what we've accomplished today has really been touching. And, um, and I'm just very thankful that we did pull this off. Um, I want to, I'm going to, obviously, there will be some thank yous, but I do want to just uh, stop for a minute and acknowledge my coordinator. I picked this girl, and did she kick butt or what? I want Donna Kassab, where are you? She's back there working out. Raise your hand. Give her a hand. She really... She made this so easy for me. All I had to really do was show up. Of course, we were grinding before, but, um, and so really allowed me to just focus on really enjoying the guests, enjoying the presentations, and enjoying uh, what we have accomplished. So, Heidelberg 3.0, Tyree Guyton, Heidelberg Project, 32 years. Yes, we've come full circle. And now it's time for us to look at how we can take history in the making, right? And take it to its next level and help Detroit, because we're part of this, help Detroit recognize again its true innovation. Detroit is historically a city of original thinkers. Isn't that right? Techno music, Motown sound, Henry Ford, that's what we do. And of course, innovation is not accomplished without a fight. And fighting is not a bad word. It just means that what we're doing is we're going against the grain, we're pushing, we're pushing, we're pushing for our vision to become a reality if we can see good seeds have been planted and good seeds have been planted with Heidelberg. Amazing seeds all over the world. So we are right. So we are stepping into our own greatness and we are here today and the person that's gonna be coming up to the stage now, I've asked him to have to do the job of taking everything that we've talked about, everything that we've been doing, and sew it together for us in a way that gives us confidence that when we leave out of here today, we know we're going forward with a new vision for the Heidelberg Project. So without further ado, 
I'd like to invite my friend, the Director of Planning and Development for the City of Detroit, Maurice Cox, to come up to the stage and bring it home for us. Give him a big round of applause. So thank you, Janine, my uh, troublemaking partner in crime here. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, to be here. Um, I haven't uh, been here um, over the course of the three days, but every day I've been getting reports back um, from the sessions. Um, everyone from Jackie Taylor, uh, who participated um, in the session yesterday, or day before yesterday, and Kimberly Driggins, our Director of Arts and Culture and Strategic Planning, uh, literally on the phone, what's happening, how did it go, what's the, the temperature in the room. So I feel like I've uh, been the fly on the wall um, and benefited from the incredible energy uh, that happens when you bring art supporters and artists together. Um, so uh, this is an, an effort to talk about um, what will look and feel like a new direction uh, for the arts community in Detroit. Um, I would argue in many ways Heidelberg exemplifies uh, the very definition of outsider art, uh, the very expectation, um, um, whether it's a fight or whether it's creative friction, um, it spoke, um, attempted to speak truth uh, to all those who would hear it, and those who would actually prefer not to hear it. Uh, and so there is, um, that's consistent. I mean, I think that's consistent with the role that artists have played historically um, as truth tellers, as those who can stand outside of uh, the community and have an objective view of what's going on uh, and bring up uncomfortable issues, right? So I think the role of artists as instigators, provocateurs, as thought leaders, um, uh, that just put it out there and the community has to respond is um, well understood, right? I think it's an, a, a legacy that uh, artists embrace and define themselves. Um, there's also uh, the role of the artist uh, as citizens those who show up and they instigate and they provoke uh, and they um, allow uh, for change to happen. So they are active, they're not standing outside of community, they um, are deeply embedded in those communities. And what does that mean um, for someone who um, engages every day with ordinary citizens? Um, that means having not just a seat at the table, but actually making the table. And we have many opportunities every day for artists to be in the place where decisions are being made. They're in community meetings, um, they're in focus groups, they're in workshops, they're in commissions. So I know from my own experience, when I wanted to instigate change in my community, um, I became the president of my, my neighborhood association. Uh, as an architect, I was known in my community as the president of the neighborhood association, which gave me access um, to people who influence, and it also gave me um, some capacity. I didn't just represent my profession or um, myself. I represented hundreds of people who lived in my neighborhood. So I believe that it is vitally important that artists uh, not think of themselves as a special group requiring special treatment, but artists who are citizens first, and they engage in their community at every single level, because that's where decisions are being made. So I hope, um, so how does it, what does this mean relative to the work that we do? As many of you know, the city has embarked on an effort to create a framework for 
the sustenance and growth of neighborhoods. Uh, and we have a first set that we are um, engaging in, uh, about 10 neighborhood geographies across the city. And these frameworks are going to determine um, how those um, neighborhoods evolve over time. And we are doing it with residents at the table. So we had a meeting uh, last, um, last week where 125 residents of Jefferson Chalmers came together to look at um, recommendations uh, that came from uh, the process of engagement, prior meetings, whether they were surveys or focus groups or youth engagement groups. Um, those were residents um, that were just ordinary citizens uh, trying to influence and sh shape their community. I think artists need to be at those meetings because those decisions are being made there. But there's a lot that I am able to do from my position to take this a step further. So those uh, neighborhood frameworks, we uh, have a team of planners who've been hired to manage that process and engage community. But to kind of increase our own bandwidth, um, we hire um, consultants to help us. And so um, this past year, one of the teams put forward uh, a partnership that was quite unusual, right? Uh, it was for the Russell Woods Narden Park uh, neighborhood. And so the, the proposal was submitted by a renowned uh, architect, um, Lorcan O'Halloran, and guess what? The co-proposal sponsor was Dabbles of the African Bead Museum. Um, he went after a public commission. He grafted his uh, art and sensibility to uh, a technical group of professionals who were also were going to be needed. And so Dabbles and uh, Lorcan O'Halloran are authoring the framework for Russell Woods and Narden Park. Um, when I saw that, I said, ha, I have uh, this, this something here. What if, if every neighborhood framework that we put out, we required that a local artist be uh, a co-author of that, or that somehow we could um, rank that to award those um, design disciplines who took the next step to actually bring artists in at the beginning um, as a way to create that creative friction um, that artists uh, provide. And so, um, so that's one example, uh, and again, a lot of this is happening kind of in real time. Um, so guess what, we're, we're also putting out uh, work for um, the Joe Lewis Greenway. Uh, have you heard about the Joe Lewis Greenway? This idea of taking the river, riverfront pedestrian and bicycle promenade and the DeQuinta cut that just runs right up here to Easton Market and taking that and wrapping it for 26 miles uh, across the city. So there's, it was used to be called the Inner Circle Greenway. Um, but we changed that because we knew the power of other cultural icons that Detroit has given the world, like Joe Lewis, that if we renamed it after Joe Lewis, we effectively, in perpetuity, have branded this city after one of our cultural heroes. So whatever this thing will become, it will always be synonymous with a black cultural figure. Uh, so that idea of grafting our arts and culture heroes onto the basic infrastructure of the city is one of the tools that we have. So the RFP is going out for that. What we think of it's going to be a, a, a greenway that is a vehicle to have public art in its very DNA. So I would argue that that RFP should have artists all over it as a way to kind of embed artists into uh, the DNA of this kind of infrastructure project that's happening. 
Um, so one of the themes I would argue is um, a, lot of, a lot of folks think of art for art's sake. Um, a lot of folks in my discipline think of design for design's sake. Of course, it's a good. I actually believe um, that we need to more um, forcefully talk about art um, as being a part of the things that we care about, whether it's community, whether it's public health, whether it's education, whether it's the built environment. So wherever I have a chance to graft on to things that I know we care about collectively as a community, I try to graft art onto it, arts and culture onto it. Again, example, there's a lot of development happening in Detroit. Um, it's your typical development, it's housing, it's mixed use development, it's a retail on the ground floor, it's housing above. Uh, it's you know, standard practice, we're trying to elevate it to a high le higher level. But very often this work doesn't really have a soul, um, it's just development. So when we went through a process on the East Riverfront and tried to figure out how do we develop the riverfront and somehow keep its authenticity, um, our first thought was we have to graft um, arts and culture onto everything that happens in it. So a developer comes forward with a mixed-use development. Some of you um, may know this story, uh, the stone soap development. So it's a series of existing um, industrial buildings on Franklin. And uh, we said, we want you to do two things when we put out the request for developer proposals. We want you to do two things. We want you to keep all the buildings and increase the density. Uh, and you figure it, you figure it out. Uh, and secondly, we want a cultural institution to anchor this site. And so what the developer do, and some of you may know uh, Shakespeare in Detroit, Sam White, a dynamic um, performer um, and CEO of Shakespeare in Detroit. Um, we put those two institutions together. So now uh, Shakespeare in Detroit will have their first permanent home as a part of what would have been a standard mixed-use development. And so all of a sudden, that development, um, there was a recent article uh, written in Fortune, in Fortune magazine about the development. And they said, can Shakespeare save the soul of Detroit? That was the tagline. Uh, so the developer completely understood that the thing that gave his project its soul was the fact that he partnered with an arts and cultural organization that might not have otherwise been able to go out alone and build a home. So think about how many times we have in Detroit to do that again and again and again, right? It means that um, the arts and culture community have to come to the table and sometimes form some unholy alliances. Because we're talking about, you know, partnering with a developer. Um, and I think that is going to be key. So wherever I see the opportunity to graft arts and culture onto something that we need, um, I push that. I was talking to, uh, uh, Jody just this morning about um, another example. These are very routine, mundane things that come uh, across my, my desk every week. DTE Energy. Um, they have to build these um, rather utilitarian substations. These are those open air utilities that are usually perimetered by some concrete uh, fence or a metal fence. Uh, and I looked at that and said, you know, these things uh, actually are not creating any beauty in the communities that they um, are planted in, even though they have a real utility. What could arts do to assist in making this more than it is? 
So we've been talking to them and we've convinced them to put out a request for artists um, partnership that will take that perimeter fence uh, and make it into a three-dimensional expression of art. So it's not about you know, painting uh, the sides of a concrete fence, it's about literally making public art out of this very utilitarian structure. Um, so what's interesting about that, I mean, DTE would have never um, thought to bring a, an artist to the table, the planning department, because we have an arts and culture um, component, did. And so we're going to make this one work. And guess what? They've got four others of those that they are trying to position in the community. That's a small example. Uh, a larger example uh, is the city is um, undertaking the transformation of about 24 miles of streets, commercial streets in Detroit. And these are those former districts where people used to shop locally that have for decades been declining. The city has decided to go in, in very walkable sections, whether it be a half a mile or a mile, and make an extreme makeover of those streets. Widen the sidewalks, plant street trees. Um, imagine um, that as a place where people would want to gather and linger. It's a $125 million capital project. So I would argue, what if every single one of them, there'll be 30 of them, had an artist as an integral part of the, uh, uh, of the team? I'm not talking about coming in and painting the side walls of the commercial stores, which in and of itself is also a wonderful expression and, and Eastern Market is an example of it. I'm talking about in the very DNA of what it means to stay in a place and have something that feels that it's of that place. Um, so structurally, we are looking at the systems by which we're going to deliver the built and natural environment and how we can systematically thread uh, arts um, through it. So um, this is um, a part of where I think the new direction is going. Um, I would say 10 years ago, the city did not have the capacity. Um, we weren't doing uh, streetscape transformations. Uh, we were not at the table when DTE said, I want to put a substation here or there. Um, and so there is a big opportunity to graft arts and culture onto everything we as a community need to produce in the built uh, in natural environment, and I um, and our team intend to be an advocate pushing every day to make that happen. So um, I think the, the next thing that I wanted to talk about is um, this notion of access um, to, to beauty and access to culture. Um, in, our, in our vision statement, we talk about building a healthy and beautiful Detroit. Uh, it's in our vision statement. And so, you know, there's a reason why I was there, and I remember when we were really reflecting, can we use the word beauty in our vision statement? Um, how are people going to interpret that? And um, I actually believe people have interpreted it really uh, well because they think of their neighborhoods as being beautiful. They certainly um, remember them during other times. Uh, and they know that they are still beautiful and that they've been made beautiful through various uh, creative ways. Um, and so we talk about beauty and access to beauty, not as something that's uh, an add-on, but as a part of our democratic right as citizens to live in a socially and environmentally and economically healthy uh, community. And so the, the, the distance between beauty, and you can interpret it however you want, but it's certainly art claims that. 
claims that space. So it's an opportunity for us to once again advocate for why uh, art is uh, a necessity. Um, it's not just an add-on, uh, because we're talking about basic rights to the access to beauty. Um, and then um, the, the, the last thing that uh, I wanted to highlight, which for me, it just gets down to the core of uh, the challenge of placemakers like artists like the Heidelberg or any number of other um, groups that have held down entire neighborhoods for Detroit uh, and given them a real sense of soul is this notion of what happens when artists go to a place, uh, make a place out of, out of no place, uh, and then make it so cool that the next moment they're being displaced um, because others have discovered that there's a really interesting place that these artists have made. And it underscores to me that if you don't own a piece of mud in this town, then you probably are fooling yourself relative to the sustainability of your institution. So at the end of the day, it's about ownership. And I believe and always have in the ownership model that uh, those who are place keepers have to find a way to own something. And my, my past experience, I've worked with nonprofit groups in a variety of um, fashions, but at the end of the day, whether it was Bayview Rural Village, a poor rural village in Virginia, at the end of the day, my job was to help them envision not just occupying and staying in that place, but owning it. And they own to today 160 acres of their community. Or whether it's the Mardi Gras Indians in New Orleans, that as you probably know, of this group of extraordinary culture producers who have an ephemeral you know, expression of their culture in these suits that they make. Um, and then otherwise, they are very secret. Um, my job uh, working with them was to, to get them to buy an entire city block of New Orleans. And at that point, you know, while their work is ephemeral, the, the bottom line is 100 years from now, they will be there because they own that block. So I think that conversation needs to pivot from, you know, can I have land uh, versus I am going to be a community developer. And it goes beyond my, my institution and my brand I'm talking about what I can do for others in the community by the power of my art. And I think that Heidelberg really, Heidelberg 3.0 exemplifies that uh, for me. Think about it. They've been here for 32 years. They've been here for a generation. So clearly, uh, they're in it for the long game. They're not going anywhere. Secondly, they have agreed to evolve as the time has changed. So if the issue is not, the primary issue is how do you get the city to understand the blight, but understand that embedded in that there's culture, um, how do you go to the next stage where you're not just um, evoking um, response um, based on the art, you're actually providing services, right? You're actually providing housing. Um, you're actually creating social institutions that support the community. You're actually, whether it's providing recreation for, uh, for children. Uh, and so what I see, um, Heidelberg in, in particular going to, is they're not just talking about the power of Tyree Guyton's art. They're talking about the power of art to make place and to build community. So I've heard more talk about McDougal Hunt is the project than I have Heidelberg Street is the project. 
that's an evolution. That's an evolution in thinking and that's an arts organization beginning to take its rightful place as a community developer. But when you do that, I think everyone knows that you need to surround yourself with other expertise. But you don't have all of the um, disciplines at the table that you need. Uh, and that means you've got to actually start to partner. And when you partner, as you know, those of you who have partners in your life, uh, you have to have trust. And to trust someone, I think, puts you in a very, very vulnerable situation. But you can't do the work that I'm talking about unless you trust someone else. And so what does trust look like, particularly when City Hall comes to uh, the table? Um, I can tell you what, you better get that trust in writing and have both parties sign, because you are basically entering into a relationship. Um, and so in this particular case, uh, because of uh, the admiration that I've had for the work that Heidelberg has done over 32 years, um, I said, you know, we need a memorandum of understanding. Like, what, what do you need to get out of this relationship, and what do I need to get out of this relationship? And uh, the Heidelberg team will tell you, it took us months and months and months to hire out uh, to hammer out um, about, a, uh, a, about seven or eight um, bullet point memor memorandum of understanding that um, the executive director, CEO, and I signed. So Heidelberg knows what we want to get out of this, and uh, so do we. So I think that that, now as our relationship has grown, um, we don't need to go back to the, the founding document to make sure we're following the rules of the engagement uh, because trust has been built. And so what does that mean for the arts organizations across the city? Does that mean that we're going to have like an MOU for every arts organization that we're working with? No. It means that there are going to emerge institutional frameworks that uh, clarify what this relationship is all about. And I think first and foremost, uh, again, it's not the first in, but this is where we're going in terms of the new direction, is the establishment of an arts council. I think it's, um, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer that we can't have single MOUs for every arts organization in the city, but we can have a defining group where um, transparency and access to resources and access um, to networks can be found. And so we've embarked on a conversation on how to do this, because there are many, many ways to do this. Many of you, you from other communities know, you know, the city council decrees, and then you have an arts council, or uh, some other entity from the top says, here's the arts council, and you know, in a lot of communities, it's some really big players on those councils. Is that what Detroit's notion of what an arts council will be is? I don't think so. So what we've agreed to do is to initiate that conversation, uh, and Kimberly Driggins will be um, facilitating it uh, with the support of others um, to have um, a notion of what an arts and culture framework for Detroit that will produce something like no other community has produced, what that looks like. Um, and so I, I don't want to make predictions, but I can tell you in the constellation of things that will anchor the future of arts in Detroit will be an arts council. And it will look different than any other council you have seen, if I know Detroit. So, um, so, so I guess I, I really can't stress enough that um, this for me is one of the defining uh, opportunities that Detroit has 
I think all of you know uh, from living this experience that we're at a very sensitive pivot point um, and we have to manage this well. Um, we have to do it in the spirit of partnership. We actually you know, have to often leave the baggage at the door, which is what I agreed to do when, when I um, felt that Heidelberg, and I, and I could be talking about others, I could be talking about dabbles, I could be talking about the sidewalk, um, sidewalk festivals, I could be talking about, you know, um, the Belleville Three. I mean, I, I could talk about any of the culture producers of this city. Um, I've been here for three years. The benefit of being here, of being new to Detroit, is the baggage. Like people would say, oh, God, but you don't know this arts organization did this and they, they slided us there. And I was like, I don't know anything about that. I wasn't here. Uh, can you leave that baggage at the door so that we can take care of business? I actually think we're at that point where folks are willing to let go of some of that stuff so that we can take advantage of this fairly unique moment that Detroit has. And you should, if anything, um, understand that you have allies in very strategic places right now. And so this is a moment to capitalize on. I'm not asking you to um, trust my words. I'm asking you to look at my actions and allow us to earn your trust. And then I think we can do something truly extraordinary in this space of arts and culture and community. So with that, thank you uh, for listening. And uh, I uh, told Janine that I would love at the end of this session uh, to have some um, dialogue on this. Uh, I suspect some of the stuff that I've been saying has been going through your heads over the past three days and much longer. And uh, I'd be happy um, to have a conversation. I don't know how much time I have to do that, but uh, um, uh, would you, uh, Alanda, would you like to facilitate this? Okay. Um, so, um, what's on your mind? <laughs> Can you repeat the question for those who didn't oh, hear? I, I was just asking um, who is going to choose or how will the members of the Arts Commission be chosen? It sounds like a great idea, but is, is that going to be generated from the arts community or you know, are you going to choose the folks or? Right. No, it's a great question and you're like maybe six months ahead of us. Uh, the question is what we're going to do is convene the conversation and within the broad based conversation of how the community feels that arts can be uh, lifted up, um, how Detroit is going to create and empower a unique Arts Commission will be determined. So I would argue it's going to come out of the conversations that we have with artists about who should be on it, how should they be appointed. Um, you know, it's a pretty um, broad cross-section. So what we've committed to, we don't know. We don't know because that is the classic from the top, I'm telling you how this is gonna happen. It's not gonna happen that way. It's going to come from a grassroots conversation that we have, and at the end of it, we will determine the size, the com composition, the mandate, all of that will emerge from uh, a facilitated conversation that we can have. And our job is to make that safe place where that conversation can be had. Yes. Maurice, good morning. Good morning. Good. Maurice, um, I was sitting here, and, and I want to be totally honest, mm -hmm. and, and you said something about trust, and I'm going to make a comment. I think trust is something that, that is earned. Absolutely. I've been here 
32 years, and I saw the need to hang in here. And as I was sitting there, I was thinking about something that John F. Kennedy said. He said, that is not what your country can do for you. Mm -hmm. What can you do for your country? Mm -hmm. For the last 32 years, I've been saying to the city and to the world, mm -hmm. art can make a difference. We have also proven it. Right. And I want to say this here. I believe that the Heidelberg Project, we have hung in there. We've been there, and we have set examples for other art institutions here and around the world. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we need to recreate the wheel. I think we need to put some air in the tide. Mm -hmm. That's my comment. Yeah, and uh, I, I agree. Uh, and part of the reason why I felt it was important to signal um, to the Detroit community that uh, this administration can work um, with all those in the arts. In fact, we're gonna start with the one that everybody thinks is the antithesis of City Hall because of the history that um, past administrations uh, have had. Um, people know that if you can make it work um, with Heidelberg, you probably can make it work with any arts organization in our constellation. So there is a, a reason why um, I felt that the first place to go is with arts organizations that have stood the test of time, who have effectively uh, created the brand. And so it's not by chance that we selected Dabbles and the Bead Museum to co-author one of the neighborhood frameworks. This has been at it for two decades. It's not by chance that we are in lockstep with Heidelberg as to helping to figure out what this um, Heidelberg 3.0 is. And I mean, uh, uh, 3.0. But it's also to me, and I, I go back to that issue, what the city can do is um, we can't lead this but we can bring resources to the table. Um, we can amplify the work. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I'm not making any uh, you know, announcements here, but part of our commitment when we said we want to surround Heidelberg with the type of resources um, that they haven't always been able to access. And so later in this month, one of the premier cultural resource uh, managers in the country are coming to sit down with Heidelberg and their board and to look at, um, just add another level of technical expertise to help define that. That was um, a resource um, that I directed to this community. And so, what my, what my experience has been is that artists and culture makers, they know what to do. Um, they don't need uh, my help. But very often, they need uh, capital. They need um, technical resources. If they've never done uh, artist housing, they need somebody who knows how to do artist housing. If they've never um, you know, had, the, they want to do uh, community ownership, and uh, so they want to know, how do I give everybody a little piece of ownership of this? Well, there are attorneys who figured out crowdsourcing. We can bring them to the table. These are the things that allow the artist community to do and be who they are and not have to become a, a jack of all trades. Um, and so that's the commitment that, um, that I am making. Uh, and as I said, don't, don't, trust me for my words. Watch my actions. And if you see that they are not lining up, call me on it. You got my cell phone. <laughs> and literally, um, I, I'm a public servant. And so I am held accountable. I can be held accountable in an audience like this, or a mayor's town hall meeting, or you know, citizens who email me, and I have to respond. So I'm not, uh, someone who uh, can't be held accountable, I am accountable. And so I am, I'm committing. I think 
you know, uh, the thing that is going to distinguish Det Detroit's recovery from other recoveries we've seen is going to be the conversation we're having here uh, today and conversations like this that I've had over and over and over in communities. So I appreciate that. Um, Thank you. Um, I, 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 I like this idea of this Arts Commission, but I am wondering why the city would not create an actual city department of arts and culture, um, similar to what you know, we had a few mayors ago, and um, a department that actually had some real teeth and some real power. It's, it's wonderful to have all these discussions, but as a journalist for 30 years, I've worked with a lot of different artists, done um, many stories. Uh, with people who, for a long time, were able to fly under the radar and do some really incredible things, um, really, you know, without asking the city for help or anything. They just were able to do it, and because the city was so strapped and bankrupt and, you know, really didn't have time to think about them, they were able to create marvelous, marvelous things. Um, but as the city has changed, um, the city is now actually enforcing you know, ordinances that it didn't used to worry about so much because they were worried about just keeping the city going. Um, and artists run up against now these ordinances that they never had to think about before. And I'm just, of course, thinking about you know, Tyree and the, the various times where a city administration has said, you know, we don't want what you're doing anymore. Uh, we're sending bulldozers. And he had no one to call to say, hey, can you step in? Can you stop this? Or can you help sure. us figure out, you know, can, you, can we have a, a stay where we can, you know, talk about it before anything drastic like this happens? And I've seen it happen to other artists too. And I feel like what they need more than they need, like another council and another commission and another bunch of meetings to go to, is an actual body or person. In fact, one person would be really helpful, I think who you can call when you're in the midst of one of these um, crises where you find yourself either in conflict with the city itself or with a developer or, or with a, a, a bunch of neighbors who maybe don't really like what you're doing. And I am wondering, can that uh, entity actually be Sure. Created? Well. I don't disagree um, that setting up these frameworks within city to be responsive to constituents um, is a, a, another level of uh, maturity in the comeback of a city where I would argue uh, most systems were broken, were, were broken. And so you have to also imagine that in less than, uh, what, 36 months, the city of Detroit has gone from six planners to 36 planners. It was once a, a, a department that was in, um, together with housing, uh, urban, urban dirt, housing development and planning, was one mega department. And the management of federal resources, which is basically uh, the charge of housing redevelopment, so overshadowed planning that I would contend there was no planning being done from City Hall. So the first thing we had to do was to build um, up our own capacity to be responsive. And now we literally do hundreds of meetings that we could not have done with a team of six. Second, secondly, I, um, because I care about the arts and culture, um, I set up a director of arts and culture. Um, the mayor didn't ask me to, the city administration didn't ask me to. In my conception of a planning department, it had a director of arts and culture. Kimberly Driggins is that person. And not only, she has a project manager that works under her. So there are two people uh, in our department. So I would argue that as uh, we prove ourselves with real tangible examples of our effectiveness, you're going to see that grow. I don't know if it'll be a standalone department, in large part because, as you said, there used to be a department. There used to be a, a lot of departments, and then the next administration comes together, comes into power, and they dismantle 
those things because it's not a part of their priority. So it has got to get out of um, City Hall and back into a body that I think is more neutral and less prone to the political swings that might happen. And so arts and, uh, you know, a, a council is one such thing. Uh, it's not the only one. Um, and what I can do, probably better than establish a new department, um, is graft arts and culture to everything the city does that has a capital expenditure. And, and that's what I meant by we're going to spend tens of million dollars on roads and remaking those streets. Wouldn't it be more powerful than three years from now to see every one of those having a unique cultural expression because an artist by way of city um, procurement was embedded in that system. That's something I can deliver. A new department, um, I, will, I will get as much pushback as imaginable of a city that has you know, got you know, bloated, couldn't pay its bills, uh, and had to close down departments left and right. So all I can say is that uh, the likely candidate to build the muscle of uh, arts and culture support embedded in city, in city government is the planning and development department. Oh, people, uh, I mean, I, you know, it's funny because the two, I, the two folks with the hands up asked two questions. That meant nobody else had a question in here. That, that means either you're completely satisfied <laughs> with what you've heard, but, uh, but okay, I wanted to have some discussion here. So Tyree, grab the mic, grab the mic. Yeah. and I'm sitting here looking at the sign. <laughs> what are we going to do with Heidelberg? Mm -hmm. I've been sitting here listening to all of these other projects and, mm -hmm. and I'm happy. But what are we going to do with Heidelberg? Sure. I, it, it, I'm sitting here and I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person sitting here. And it feels this way. Mm -hmm. And I'm listening and I'm saying, wow. Trust is important. We have done something. Mm -hmm. And we have said to you all, we want to work with you. Mm -hmm. We have done something that's made a difference here. We have a plan. We have had a plan for the last 25 years. And I think that I can say this too. Now we have some money. And I want to dance. And I want to know whether or not the city really want to dance. Well, I can. And I'm a little confused yeah. here. I want to know whether or not the city really want to get sure. down. I want to do something. Sure. We came here hoping to leave out of here. I want to leave out of here. I'm going to leave out of here. Knowing that we have something concrete. I have not heard that. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking for something concrete. Sure. From the city on the city's part. Sure. And Thank you. Yeah. No. And uh, again, I am uh, able to answer both the larger change in direction that I am trying to usher in um, in uh, in Detroit relative to how we we address uh, this resource, um, but also have a I have a very clear um, notion about the opportunity that Heidelberg presents. So. As I said, I you know don't know. I'm mean, not here to make any announcements, but you know one uh, one of the things that will be happening this Thursday and Friday um, is um, a significant cultural resource um, professional are coming to work with Heidelberg and its board this Thursday and Friday. These folks are perhaps the best in the nation at what they do. So that the, what it means in terms of the expanse of Heidelberg and how it impacts McDougal Hunt as, a, um, as an instigator of neighborhood transformation will emerge out of that process. 
I also think it's, it's not just about you know, artist houses, or it's not just about Heidelberg Street, it's about a much larger campus, geographically a larger campus, that I believe extends to buildings uh, along the Beltline that are industrial buildings that are looking for a new purpose, to McDougal um, that is a, you know, a mixed uh, commercial corridor. So for me, it's about grafting the vision of Heidelberg onto real development projects. I, I think that's what I am talking about doing. And I, I have, um, I think capacity has to be um, demonstrated and I think Heidelberg is doing it as we speak um, with the Numbers House. The Numbers House, as many of you know, this is the first time that uh, Heidelberg is entering into that space to provide housing and uh, arts, gallery, and community. That's a new watershed moment. That's concrete. Six, eight months from now, we will be able to convene in that space. So is that the future of Heidelberg, or is it going to do it six more times? Is it going to do it 12 more times? Um, are they going to take over a space of this scale? that doesn't fit on a residential street, but may be in its proximity, I, I believe that a framework is emerging. And that's about as, as concrete as I, I can be. That's the direction that I have understood that the organization would like to go in, and you have a partner in getting there. And I gotta end it right there. Can we give Maurice Cox, the Director of Planning and Development of the City of Detroit, a hand? I gotta be the bad guy and move us along. Thank you, Maurice. Uh, coming up next, we have a program director from the Earth Family Foundation, Jody Rains, to come in. Uh, what we're hoping this session will be is just a high time of reflections, um, positive affirmations, and thoughts about uh, this experience and how it has gone. So, Jody Rains, let's give her a hand. Um, so John Herb was sorry he couldn't uh, be here today, the president of the foundation, um, but I'm here to represent Herb, and we've been a longtime friend of Heidelberg's. Uh, we've been around 10 years, and we've been supporting Heidelberg for 10 years. If we'd been around for 30 years, we probably would have been supporting them for 30 years, but we came in a little bit later. But anyways, I think, um, so I'm supposed to give some closing remarks, but I kind of want to take us back to um, what the conversation has been over the past um, few days, because I think it's been really rich and wonderful, and so we are really excited that this city um, is now, after 32 years, supporting arts and supporting Heidelberg, and that is fantastic. Um, and I think this was obviously just the start of a longer conversation about what that really means. Um, and so, but that's only part of it. That's only part of what uh, Heidelberg and the arts are about, right? And so one of the reasons that our foundation supports the arts, we have this area called arts and community life. And so it's about how the arts, uh, I mean, including arts in development and making the city look more beautiful, that's great. Um, but it's also about really strengthening and lifting up community, connecting with community, uh, empowering community. It's, it's all about reflecting community, helping community kind of think about and people, it's about people in the communities. Um, and that's uh, one of the reasons we've been supporting Heidelberg, and that's what I've been hearing the last few days uh, during this conference, is it's all very deeply personal, personal um, and art is medicine. Uh, Maurice talked about uh, beautiful and healthy communities and talking about what art does to add to the beauty, but it's also adding to the health of communities. So it's really a very holistic kind of um, uh, conversation, um, an approach to the arts, that I'm hoping we can kind of close the conference out on. So rather than my personal reflections, I really wanted to open it um, up to you all so that we can close it out with what is this, what has the last couple days really meant to you and what are you thinking, what are you re-energized now to go forward and do? And I'm just going to call in a coup to start it off because she just happened to be the first one that I saw when I walked in and, and when she was telling me we were talking about what the last couple days have meant, what she had to say was so powerful and I thought, um, it's best to hear from you all what really this has, what this has meant, and, and let's leave on a really 
uplifted, positive, energized note. And she'll come up here and talk, but then I think we can just open it up and you can come up and talk, you can talk from your seats, however you want to do it. And then I'll just close off with a couple of things. But Akuka Dojo, um, for those of you who don't know, has been a longtime friend of Heidelberg. And she's the, I don't know the exact title, but the director of the arts uh, and theater program at Spelman College. So. Thank you. This is going to be the interactive part of the program. Um, so before I actually give my thoughts, if you reach under your seats, there might be something under there. So grope around. This is interaction number one. <laughs> and if they ain't nothing, then they don't get the prize. <laughs> Sorry, it's going to be 360. It's going to be a 360. Oh, where is it? There it is. There it is. And there's going to be a prize that you can get, Donna. Do you have the prize? It's. Oh. <laughs> there you go. You could. Yes. Yes. Come up. Yes. This is interactive, everybody. Believe me, you're all going to be involved. So don't get comfortable in your seats. Oh, congratulations, yes. I'm sorry, oh yes. Yes. That's an original uh, Guyton print. I want to show it to the audience. This is our prints that Tyree did while he was in Switzerland for the year. And it's a limited edition print, and we wanted to make sure that we honor uh, this collection and honor you guys by giving one of these beautiful prints away. So you are the lucky one, my dear. So I wanted to talk about a little bit, and I'm not going to speak long because we're actually all going to speak, and I've thought about, I'm a performer, so this is gonna be the performative part. Um, but you come to conferences and you don't know what you're going to get. You know, sometimes you're wondering if you're speaking to the converted, you know, because you're in the room and it's like, oh yeah, we're all similar thought in the same place. And you're hoping that you will take away something that you can go forward with. And so for myself, I, I mean, even listening to the stimulating conversation this morning, where do we go with government? And where do we go when Michael Stone Richards threw the gauntlet down? Where do we go with gentrification? Where do we go? Where do we go from here? So hopefully, ideas like that are stimulated. Whatever space that we're going to go back into or go forward into, what do we take away? So, and that's gonna be your question that I'm, what is, what is your takeaway from this moment for myself the different panels that I was able to listen to on Friday, going to see Tyree's new space where he's working in, that he's inside that community, because he said, I'm going back to Heidelberg when he moved off Watson Street. And we, we know how painful that was, that move. I mean, I watched a couple of painful, difficult moves with Janine and Tyree and Heidelberg and moving forward and moving on. And then something else happens, then there were the fires that were endured and fire, fire is something about Detroit. I live in the city of Atlanta now. Atlanta was burned down. You know, we forget those things about fire and, and what comes up of the ashes and what's reborn. So nothing stays the same. It's gonna, you know, I lived in the country of Australia. One thing indigenous people teach you, when you have fire, it reignites the seeds. You gotta have fire with everything else. So, they're going to be turbulent times, it's going to be hot, and it means, and I, I felt that this for myself, I was stimulated with those ideas. I had to think about a lot of things. I had to think about, and I mentioned in my own panel, you know, a number of weeks ago, I went to the memorial, the lynching memorial. That's been haunting me. The architecture of that place has been haunting me. But who did I carry with me? I carried Grandpa Sam Mackey with me. Because Sam Mackey saw bodies swinging in the wind, baby, and that's our history too. That's every one of our histories in this room. That's part of us. 
So I thought about that so I could come back forward and think about that and I thought about it as I looked at the tree last night in Tyree's exhibition with the shoes hanging because you could see their soles swinging in the wind. That's what I took with me. And so art made me think about that. So I've had a lot of ideas. What I'm gonna teach next week in my performance class, is it gonna be about cities? Is it gonna be about making artivists, artists, activist citizens as we go forward? That's what I'm taking with me, because I hope, I asked my mother this morning, I looked at her and I said, how do I stimulate creativity? That's what my question, I walk away with that idea. How do I stimulate dynamic creativity in my students, the next generation? So here's what I'm going to have us do. I'm not going to talk a long time. That's, that's my big takeaway, probably. So I'm walking away with going, hmm, how do I stimulate dynamic creativity? Because I've been stimulated myself with ideas, listening to people, meeting people going forward. So since this is 360 degrees, I'm going to have us all stand up. And we're going to make a big circle in this room. And you're going to take somebody's hand. And I'm going to pass this microphone around because we're gonna make a circle in this room. We're gonna figure it out and be very creative with the tables and everything else. Yes, everybody should get in. Yep, we might have to spread out a little bit or you might have to come in, but we can make this work. How do we, the wonderful thing that Heidelberg has shown us is how we make it work. How we make it work. So this is a bit of, you know, this is a bit of an exercise that I do with my students and something that I do, but it's going to be our community. I'm going to pass this mic around. I'm going to encourage you to either just say a short phrase or a word or something that you have taken away from this conference this weekend. What did you get? What do you want to say? And you're going to put it in this circle. I'm going to share it with you. I'm going to go over there. I'm going to come back all around. I'm going to start with the joke. It's like I've, I've taken in so much that I can't even put in words, like for real, for real. But I know that um, that God has put me in the right place at the right time because I'm I'm in a I'm in a in a place in my life where growth is exponential and opportunities are everywhere. And being able to be here and be a, be in this space with you guys and your spirit and your your just creativity you know what i'm saying it, it keeps me striving because um me and my brother we've been we've been we've been striving every single day and just to see that you guys are still striving you know what i'm saying it's it's we, we got so much work to do but um yeah i'm just saying yeah. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jackie Taylor, I'm part of the uh, City Planning Department and um, on Friday I was part of a panel that talked about preservation of the Heidelberg Project and I know that it's a really complicated issue because the Heidelberg Project is more than just a few pieces of art, it's a neighbourhood, a community, it's people, it's objects, it's everything that you could possibly think about to preserve, so how on earth do you do that? Well, the only thing that I can say is to begin with what's here today, which is the issue of the work on And that's the commitment and energy to take this forward. It's lasted a long time. This is really extremely unusual. So I have extreme faith that we can preserve the high level of what it always has been. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael Merchant, and um, I'm Um, my parents met and married in Detroit. I'm um, a daughter of a Korean immigrant and a white woman. And um, one thing you learn 
I think they drew their strength from having met and married in Detroit. Um, and one thing you learn as a daughter of an immigrant is that by the time, you, in the time that people can talk about getting a thing done, you can actually get a thing done. And one of the, uh, I love so many things about the Heidelberg Project, but one of the things I love is the seeing that example set again. In the time you can talk about getting a thing done, a thing can happen. And that gives me tremendous faith in, you know, the future of the project and also reinforces what my parents taught me. And so I just want to see as much of that going forward as I can. And one word is okay too. You don't <laughs> 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 keep it going, keep it moving. Keep it moving. Hi, my name is Tom Girl. I'm here with my wife who's working on this uh, project and um, I just want to say what I see from this is growth. Growth in the city. Hi, I'm Joan, I'm Tom's wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, my takeaway was uh, listening to Charles uh, Smith speaking and talking about um, that we all have something inside of us. And um, he almost put me to tears. <laughs> but um, we have to find out what it is, and then we just have to go forward with it. Hi, I'm Holly. I had something similar to Joan's idea in terms of uh, preserving or sustaining some of the ideas of the Heidelberg Project. I'm thinking of Be the Best of You that we saw and heard about last night and over the weekend, and taking some of that best parts and giving back, bringing to you into the community. Thank you. Hi, I'm I'm Linda Allen, and I'm an artist, and uh, it, I believe art and creativity give us superpowers, and I believe in the power of three to creativity and beyond. Uh, good morning, Kimberly Driggins. Uh, I have three words, uh, takeaways, passion, commitment, and sustainability. Hello, I'm Lauren Hood. Um, I wear a lot of hats. Right now, I feel like I'm in a time where a lot of the things I've been working on forever are about to manifest, and I get afraid to do things because I feel like I'm going to do it wrong, or that people won't like it. But something that's been reinforced throughout the, the course of this conference is that, yes, that's going to happen, but you need to do it anyway. So that's what I'm taking away. Good morning. My name is Anthony. I'd say what I took away the most was from yesterday's conversation. Uh, two things. One, in understanding how to deal with diversity, of course, that I work and has uh, experienced many challenges over time. One thing that Tyree said yesterday is uh, making space for that sort of inner voice and uh, how his told me to make it great no matter what happened. So I uh, took that to heart. And also, just kind of just always uh, investigate my relationship with time and trusting that as this project has proven, um, following what been driven to do and trust that in time uh, your vision will be realized. Hello, I am Victoria and uh, something that I took from this conference really is that two plus two equals eight, make it up. Um, I feel like a lot of the times you get to this space, especially when you're trying to career in your life and you feel like you have to do everything perfect and have the perfect education. And you can just up. And I also took up from, from Dr. Smith the idea that when you see that need, you know, go do it, go feel that need in your community. You don't have to wait around for someone else to do it. You can go do it, you can go find those resources and just, you know, feel that need for your community. So. Hi, Rachna Anita, and um, we just have to keep that fire going, but because what I realized is the more you push the envelope, the harder it gets. Having listened to Tyree and Janine, 
over the last three days, having lived in the suburbs for 18 years, but having seen Heidelberg for the first time day before yesterday, it just has taught me how little I was with my complaints, complaining about an artist for three years, what they've endured in 30 years is absolutely, I don't think anyone could imagine that. So thank you, Tyler and Jane, for leading the way. Uh, that's what I have to say, keep the fire.
Smith said to me when I first met him on Thursday. He said, when God gives you a mission, you don't need permission. Go on and do something. So. <laughs> I'm Megan, I'm a neighbor. Um, my takeaway is mostly information. Uh, I interact with a lot of different community groups. It's mostly about spreading as much information, connection, and takeaways, trying to process a very dense impact we get. I'm Kelly, uh, husband of Megan. Uh, and as Maurice put it, owner of a little bit of mud on my And uh, my phrase is, it's time to earn that trust together. Uh, hi, my name is Carlos, and I'm a homeless servant, and I'm here to hear and support the Tiger Guy, uh, as well as all long-time artists and residents here of Detroit, which should have first-hand, first-hand uh, support, first-hand in money, plenty of money, uh, and uh, uh, first-hand in projects.
If I can recycle things, I can recycle my mind. Nothing goes to waste. People's lives matter. People think about and make things that are important and useful to them. Um, I create a safe place for sharing through consensus learning, not majority rules. Graft, DNA, trust. My name is Sarah Khan, and uh, I'll be brief. I think of equity, historical equity. I think of Helen Tanner, who worked with indigenous people in the Midwest to fight for their treaty rights with the U.S. government until the day she died in the 90s. And she taught me an Ojibwe prayer that I'd like to share with you. It's very short. You could repeat after me. With the idea of equity at the center, blessings and balance, blessings and balance. balance and blessings. For with balance, come all blessings. We are all one family. My name is Jules Polk, and my most proud title is board member of the Heidelberg Project. And Tyree's always asking what time it is. <laughs> it's Heidelberg time. <laughs> Thanks, Jules. Thanks for stealing my name. <laughs> but it doesn't make it any less relevant. Andy Stern, also a board member. It's time. Art and culture first, um, city and government and planning. After. <laughs> Hi, that is Mitch and Gina. Um, I think this has been an inspiring reminder of um, when someone puts up a roadblock or tells you no, find a way to work around them. I'm Javier. Um, what I'm taking away from this is stop making excuses. Just do what you have to do. Uh, take responsibility for your, my gift and uh, take it to the next level. If I take re responsibility for my gift, it will happen for me. My gift will make room for me. Good morning, my name is Keith, I'm with the Hala team. And what kept going through my mind is community. Uh, just grateful, gratitude for the community here, the sacrifices that have been made from Janine and Tyree and the board, the wisdom for us to be here, and then intentional inclusion. You know, when we talk about voices at the table, and we want to apologize for not having our Hala youth here, but next time they will be. So we have some new voices at the table. Good morning, my name is Sean. My takeaways are that I work magic, and possibilities. I'm excited and I'm grateful about all of those. Amen. Give them the understanding to know that you can't follow until you learn how to lead. And give them to the know that you're in the midst of them by the thing that you do that we call miracles. In Jesus' name. Let me say this before I depart here today going back home. Everybody in the circle, in the military is called a 360. In the military, everybody move in on the center and focus on them dots over there by Janine. <laughs> Tell Janine to draft the letter of this meeting today and send it to Mr. Cox and say, this is what we want for Detroit and all of you sign it. And they'll know that you got a leader. Thanks, Dr. Smith. <laughs> um, my and thanks, I now have a lot of new friends. This has been really exciting. I also learned some new math. I really <laughs> gratefully appreciate being able to, being welcomed here and being able to be part of something huge, something mighty, something messy, and something beautiful. 
and I hope to be part of um, responding to Dr. Smith's sign yesterday and being part of the dream not being dead. Hello everyone, my name is Anya Dennis. I am here with Hala. Um, what echoes in my mind, or what has echoed in my mind throughout this conference is the idea of endless possibilities. The possibility to create, the possibility to dance, the possibility to love, the possibility to grow, and the possibility to challenge ourselves to be better today than what we were yesterday. And that is what Janine and Tyree set the example for us to do at the Hala at the Hollywood Project, so I thank you. Hi, I'm Maine. I have two words. The first one of them is hopefulness. I think it has been inspiring to be in this group of people talking to one another, sometimes talking past each other a little, but toward a common goal of making this a better community, making Heidelberg and Detroit the model it can be uh, for people coming together, working together, not only envisioning, but creating a new world. It's been exciting and, to me, very hopeful, these, these uh, conversations. My other word, and I kind of view this as, oh, before I go to my last word, Hilda, I want to come back to your word about soldier for Tyree. Do you spell that S-O-U-L-D-I-E-R? <laughs> So my, my, uh, my second word, besides hopefulness, my second word, and I kind of view it as a verb, is yay. <laughs> my shoulders burn. Um, if nobody told y'all today, I love y'all. Um, love you. Um, but overall, to kind of like sum it up, back to the beginning in a circle. Um, what I took away is that if you have a problem, create your own solution. Two plus two equal eight. Yeah. So I'm glad Tony said love. My, I'm, I'm Jody Rains. Um, my words are um, people, um, creativity, and love. Hot over 360 degrees. Keep the faith, baby.